Welcome to the Deep Dive. Today we're going deep into some childhood classics, but uh, with a twist. We're talking about those grim fairy tales you probably think you know. Cinderella, Sleeping Beauty, all the classics. And let me tell you, those stories are even wilder than you might remember. That's what we're here to find out. I'm so glad you could join us for this deep dive. Glad to be here. So everyone knows the name Grimm, but what's the story behind the brothers themselves? Were they just like wander around the Black Forest collecting stories? Well, it makes for a nice image, but the reality is a bit more grounded. Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm were serious scholars, very much products of their time and place, early 19th century Germany, hmm. a period of intense change and upheaval. So not exactly all fairy tales and happy endings then? Not exactly. Think Napoleon revolutions, a young Germany trying to find its footing. It was a turbulent time. Okay, so not exactly a fairy tale setting. How did that shape the Grimm's work? Well, for one thing, they were acutely aware of the fragility of culture. Their own lives were marked by both privilege and loss. Their father was a lawyer, but died unexpectedly when they were young, leaving their family in a difficult financial position. Wow, I hadn't realized that about their background. It had a profound impact on them. They became incredibly driven, dedicated to their studies, and they both ended up at the University of Marburg. So how did they go from being scholars to, you know, the Brothers Grimm? What happened at Marburg? Marburg wasn't just about hitting the books. It was about immersing themselves in the intellectual currents of the day, specifically romanticism. Romanticism, like poetry, nature, all that. Exactly. Think emotion, intuition, a fascination with folklore in the past. Okay, I see where this is going. Suddenly, fairy tales aren't just kids' stuff anymore. Precisely. The romantics saw these stories as expressions of the soul of a people, a window into their history and values. So the Grimm's were tapping into that. They believe these stories held a deeper significance. Absolutely. For them, collecting these tales wasn't just a hobby, it was a kind of cultural rescue mission, a way to preserve a vital part of German identity. That's fascinating. They weren't just collecting stories, they were curating a whole cultural movement. You could say that. They recognized the power of these tales to connect people to their past, to their shared humanity. I'm dying to know more about the sources they used. Did they just wander around interviewing random villagers, or was there a more formal process? Well, it was a bit of both, actually. While they did collect stories from oral traditions, their research shows that many of their sources were actually educated, middle-class people, often women, from their own social circles. Wait, really? <laughs> I always pictured them, you know talking to old folks in smoky taverns, listening to tales by the fireside. That might have happened too. But it seems a good chunk of their material came from more, shall we say, refined sources. They even drew upon their own family's storytelling tradition. Wow, I never knew that. It really adds another layer to understanding their work, doesn't it? It does. And speaking of layers, we should probably talk about the tales themselves. Because those iconic versions we know and love, well, they're not exactly what the Grimm's first wrote down. Okay, now you've got my attention. Spill the enchanted beans. How dark are we talking here? Well, let's just say those classic fairy tales had a bit of an edge to them. A much darker edge than what we're used to. Okay, you've got to give me some examples. We're talking about the original Grimm versions here. The originals. Let's take Snow White, for instance. Everyone loves Snow White. Exactly. But in the Grimm's version, it wasn't a wicked stepmother, but Snow White's biological mother who wanted her dead. Whoa, now that's some serious family drama. What about Cinderella? Was it always a glass slipper and a happily ever after? Well, the glass slipper was there, but um, the stepsisters, they weren't just mean girls. They were, uh, well, they were willing to go to some pretty gruesome lengths to fit into that slipper. Okay, now you have to tell me more. Ah. What kind of lengths are we talking about? Let's just say there were a few, shall we say, surgical adjustments involved. <laughs> we're talking self-inflicted amputations here. Ouch. I guess that's what happens when you try to force your feet into a glass slipper. It's a bit much, right? But you have to remember, these stories were a product of their time. Life back then was often harsh and brutal, and those realities found their way into the tales. So it's no surprise that the Grimm's later editions toned things down a bit. Exactly. As they continued to refine their work, they became more aware of their audience, which increasingly included children. Right. Gotta keep it somewhat PG. Precisely. And the rise of Victorian sensibilities in the 19th century played a role, too. People were a bit more sensitive to, shall we say, graphic content. Makes sense. But, but it wasn't just about making the stories less scary, was it? Didn't the Grimm's also shape these narratives to align with their own values? 
Absolutely. They weren't just recording these stories. They were actively molding them. They would add Christian symbolism, emphasize moral lessons, really try to present their ideal of German culture and values through these tales. Do you have any examples of specific changes they made? Like, how did they go about grimifying these stories? We'll take Rapunzel, for example. Early versions of the story contained hints of her, um, let's just say, becoming pregnant after meeting the prince. Wow. Really? Talk about a plot twist. Right. They omitted that little detail in later editions. They definitely sanitized some of the, shall we say, adult themes, didn't they? They were adapting the stories for their time. And sometimes they'd actually add entirely new elements. For example, the iconic spinning wheel in Sleeping Beauty. That wasn't in the original oral tales. Wait, really? So that was a grim invention? A grim invention. They weren't afraid to take some creative liberties, even as they were trying to preserve these stories. That's fascinating. It really shows how much thought and intention they put into their work. Mm -hmm. They weren't just passive collectors of fairy tales, but active shapers of them. Exactly. They were looking to find the heart of these stories and present them in a way that resonated with their own values and beliefs. It makes you wonder about the choices behind those changes, doesn't it? Like, mm -hmm. what were they trying to say? But we've talked a lot about the Grimm's and their fairy tales. What about their broader impact? Their work went way beyond just collecting and editing these stories. Right? Yeah, so much more, yeah. I mean, we've talked about the darker side of fairy tales and how the Grimm's put their own spin on those classic stories, but their influence goes way beyond just that, right? Absolutely. Their impact on linguistics is huge, especially Jacob Grimm. You can't talk about the history of languages without mentioning his work, specifically something called Grimm's Law. Okay, Grimm's Law. That sounds intense. It is, kind of. Basically, it explains how sounds in languages change over time. Like over centuries. Over centuries, yeah. It's like a linguistic code that helps us understand how different languages are related, how they evolved from common roots. So like tracing words back in time. Exactly. It's like a linguistic time machine. For example, remember that Latin word for father, pater? <laughs> well, Grimm's Law helps us understand how pater eventually became father in English or how the Latin tres became the English three. Well, wow, so we're talking about these like systematic shifts in language that happened over generations. Exactly. And the Grimm's were instrumental in cracking that code. That's incredible. So they weren't just fascinated by fairy tales. They were trying to unravel the mysteries of language itself. And they were really good at it. On top of Grimm's Law, they also took on this massive project of compiling a comprehensive German dictionary. Well, yeah, ambitious. They were passionate about preserving not just stories, but the essence of their language, the very soul of it, you could say. It's like they were creating this incredible tapestry of German culture stories, language, history, all woven together. Exactly. They saw the interconnectedness of it all. And they weren't afraid to stand up for their beliefs either, even when it was dangerous. What do you mean? Well, they were part of this group known as the Guttingen Seven, a group of professors who protested against the King of Hanover's attempts to suppress academic freedom. So they were fighting for freedom of thought, freedom of expression. Exactly. They were ultimately dismissed from their positions for their activism. Wow. Talk about putting your beliefs into action. Mm -hmm. So they weren't just scholars. They were kind of rebels, too. In a way, yes. But their dedication to their principles only solidified their legacy. That's amazing. This has been such an eye-opening journey. Thank you so much for taking us on this deep dive into the world of the Brothers Grimm. My pleasure. It's always a fascinating topic to explore. And to you, dear listener, we leave you with this. The next time you encounter a fairy tale, any fairy tale, Remember, there's always more to the story than meets the eye. Don't be afraid to dig a little deeper, to look beyond the surface and discover the hidden depths and the rich history woven into these timeless tales.